you know, people often underestimate Latin America. I was having lunch with a very prominent Indian businessman. And Latin America, if you add the GDP of Latin America, we happen to be 2x India with one quarter of the people or one third of the people. So Latin America has the size, has 600 plus million, a big population. So there's a lot to be done in Latin America that we just got started at SoftBank. And the few success stories that you have today have given birth to a lot of other hopes, dreams that are in the process of being made, new journeys that are being made, because now Latin America has a lot of histories of success, right? You look at Nubank, great example. To me, the world's best digital bank. Look at Mercado Libre, nothing to envy to an Amazon or to a, an Alibaba, et cetera. You look at Globant, which is real software building shop from Argentina that serves clients globally, not the sort of thing people associate with Latin America. So different kinds of companies get created in the region. Which and the market. Surprising the, to most The people. market is amazing. In lo, you know, when we were investors in Uber, you know, we had to keep it a secret that after New York, three of the top five cities were Latin American cities. Latin America, the economy is one that will, that will take on any new digital disruption at an accelerated pace. Look at Netflix, WhatsApp, and all that. You mentioned TikTok. Mm. Uh, Latin America is a huge market for them. Oh, it's been unbelievable for us helping, in terms of Latin audience. Helping helping. Machine. Yeah. You know, Latin America is absolutely booming, right? So it's great to be in a market where you have, it's the early stage of entrepreneurship, but with great founders, but also you have a market that's ripe for consuming any digital good at an accelerated pace. I, I, before we dive into Latam, I do just have to ask on the firm itself, you know, what do you think is the biggest challenge that you are yet to prove out? So an example, like when I think of mine, it's that I can build a firm beyond myself. <laughs> Every fucking LP asks that. Um, how do you think about what your biggest challenge is in terms of the firm build ahead? I think it's really tied into the region. Nobody doubts that you could create a growth equity firm in this day and age. Sure. Lots of people have done that. Question is, can LATAM support a multi-fund growth equity firm? We strongly believe the answer is yes. We think it's obviously yes, but that's something the rest of the world doesn't quite believe yet. And so it'll take time to prove that out. And in a sense, that makes the task very simple. We just have to execute. We have high conviction in what we're doing. We just have to put one foot in front of the other and the, the proof will emerge over time. And that proof is in the form of big outcomes. So you want the next new bank to go public in New York. Like that'll kind of quiet the critics. But it's getting over the regional argument, really, because we're very tied into the story of Latin America. It's a misconception of the region, right? I mean, you ask some people and they think, oh my God, this is the land of drug trafficking, high inflation, and constant political turmoil. <laughs> soccer. And, and soccer, which is great. Football, for you, Football, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the opposite. You know, Latin America is to me the land of opportunity. And I think Latin America is the only place where, which is great because there are more opportunities than capital available. Everywhere else, there's more capital than opportunities available, which drives crazy valuations and others. So I think we're in a great place. We understand Brazil, we understand Mexico, we understand Colombia, which are the three largest markets. And I am a huge believer in the macro story of Latin America. And I think the next 10 years are going to be the best 10 years of Latin America for two very, very simple reasons. One is nearshoring. I mean, long, go long are the days where companies will have one supply chain and be only China. And if you want to serve the other side of the world, Mexico suddenly becomes a place to serve the US. So nearshoring, it's real, very important. And secondly, commodities are going to be an important part of the whole new energy model or the electrification of the world. And few people know that between Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, that's 60% of the world's lithium. It means that's Bolivia alone is one third of the world's lithium. So suddenly, co th those, the prices of those commodities are going to be steady for the next 10 years, and Latin America is sitting on that. I don't know if you know, but Brazil will become the largest food exporter in the world. So all that means is this com these countries are going to be, I would call them economically sound. I'm not going to say they're going to thrive because a lot of people have said that and made mistakes, but I feel very good about the future of the economy 
of the two most important markets in Latin America, which is Mexico and Brazil. Can I ask? It's nice to have tailwinds, and they have tailwinds. Everyone needs a tailwind. Everyone needs a tailwind. <laughs> One thing that I'm always struck by is, is the difference of opinion I get on homogeneity of LATAM, where some people kind of block it together and go, LATAM as an opportunity is this huge opportunity, and look at the uh, kind of collective audience we have here of 650 million, and it's basically the you know, whatever we want to choose, this huge market. And then others say, no, it's incredibly fragmented. Each country is very individual. It's much more European in its structure where you have to win Mexico, Argentina, and you can't look at it as a kind of block opportunity. Which one's right, do you think? Well, for sure, there's Brazil and everything else. Yeah. Not even, Mexico. But even language is different in Brazil. So you have what's generally called Spanish-speaking Latam and Brazil, which is not Spanish-speaking. Brazil is its own beast. Mexico is also a large entity within Spanish-speaking Latam. So if you were to disaggregate two countries and pull them out, it would be Brazil and Mexico in that order. And if you ignore everything else, those are huge markets. That's more than half of the population of 650 that Marcelo mentioned and most of the purchasing power and two very well-run central banks that have performed incredibly over the last two years. The currencies of Brazil and Mexico have been some of the best performing currencies in the world because the central banks hiked early. Brazil is already on the phase of easing interest rates. So these are two really interesting economies with tailwinds. And then you have as a plus some of the other markets. Some will always be challenging. Argentina has perpetually been a challenging market. It's never gotten currency under control. It's very difficult to uh, figure out what the value of your peso is over time. Colombia is having a challenge now, uh, but we're long-term bullish on Colombia. But if you really had to focus, it's Brazil and Mexico. And in a sense, I suppose that would be like Germany and France. You know, if you want to pick the EU example, I'm, I'm sure in Europe, there's a similar answer to mm -hmm. that. We're here, are the two markets that really matter. And that's the, the same is true in Latin America. But I would add two things, right? It is expected that both the Brazilian and the Mexican economy will be among the top 10 economies of the world. So it's top nice. Top six, yeah, 2050. Okay. And then secondly, Argentina is great because in Argentina, you have something that you can export, which is services, people. The amount of engineers, the amount of lower price labor because of inflation and others. So I look at in Argentina, that's why you have created companies. I wouldn't say that's why I think they're great on their own, you know, global and all over the world, but that was the beginning. And I think that you know, if you can, if you can, if you can play in two of the top ten world's economies and be strong there, right? I think you can build a great firm around that. If we think about, you mentioned the, the services and the amazing talent. If we kind of go up the stack or down the stack, whatever way we want to take it, but to the kind of financing, we saw the evacuation of kind of foreign capital in the last year with the kind of economic changes that we've seen. Is that a good thing for you or not? In a way, there's less competition, fantastic. And also in a way, there's less financing available for LATAM companies and less co-investors. How do you analyze the foreign capital withdrawal? It's a balance sheet. There, there are pluses and minuses. One of the biggest minuses is you have big pref stacks all over the place. Mm -hmm. All these companies that raised a lot of capital whose valuations right now should be much lower than the round they did in 2021, who have pref stacks that are underwater. And it's very difficult to finance those companies even at a discount, because what are you buying? Right? If you're buying secondary early uh, A shares or common shares, then you're under this huge pref stack. So I think that's a very big negative. The positive is there are fewer people competing and prices have become much more rational. To me, I love it. Right, there's tourist, you know, tourist capital is done. I mean, which is great. I mean, this is left for people who understand the market, who understand the opportunity, who are really going to help entrepreneurs. So uh, it's better, it's cleaner, it's uh, it's people who, I mean, there were people who showed up there in late 2021 because they were they were like sheep, right? SoftBank was leading the way, and they all came behind. I think there's, there's going to be left to two great ones. You know, I have a lot of respect for GA. I mean, if you look at good. the returns of GA, people often don't know, but if you truly study GA, the great returns have come from Latin America. It's very funny. I just uh, got off a call with Martin Escobari, uh, and he said exactly the same thing as you did in terms true. of the tourist capital. So it's going to be GA. Hopefully, it's going to be us, right? And then the rest, you know, they don't even know what the capital of some of these countries are. So it's great. We like it that way, and hopefully... It will stay like that. I want people to be busy thinking about the US, thinking about China, thinking about Europe, 
and we'll do our thing in Latin America. We're going to help entrepreneurs and we're going to go help and build some of the most amazing companies and, that yeah, and, and they're proven they're capable of building. And we like to be collaborative. So th- th- there are other firms. QED has had a presence on the ground for a long time. Yeah. Warburg has a presence on the ground. There's a new firm that spun out of GIC um, that has a presence on the ground. Uh, Tomasic, sorry, not GIC, that has a presence on the ground. We love to co-invest with these firms. I think the A is where the elbows are sharpest. Yeah. Seed, you get a lot of people coming together. Growth, you get a number of people coming together. And so we're happy to be that catalyst for other capital, whether it's local or foreign, but we want to price it. We want to assess the risk and bring other capital to the region. How important do you think it is having feet on the ground, being there, having offices in the cities? Extremely, extremely. There's a lot of adverse selection. There's some founders who might or might not be great, who play really well in New York and San Francisco. And so if you wait for them to come to you, that's all you'll think Latin America is. We were just in Brazil and we went to the middle of Brazil to a state called Goyas, to a town called Goiania. I don't know how many investors have been there. They said we were the first ones to go visit them at their offices, really interesting company. Those folks are not going to New York to raise capital from 57th Street. You have to go and find them and build a relationship. I love that. And you have to understand what Latin America is all about, right? You have to have lived in Latin America and we have a good group of people who live there. You have to understand you know how people think in Latin America. If you want to be a great investor, I mean, you got to, in many cases, speak their language. It's not about just showing up in Silicon Valley. About it, I, I, I'm, I'm a believer that those days are are long gone. I'm naive, Marcelo. How do they think differently? If I, you know, I, I could describe how Europeans think differently to U.S. If you were to compare U.S. to Latin American people, how do they think differently? We have different issues, right? Our education is way worse or health systems are broken. So anytime you bring technology to help you with health, it is incredibly, people adopt it extremely fast. Education in many cases is pretty bad. So suddenly when you start bringing online learning methods, it's really, really helpful. Uh, Transportation was broken. This is why Uber exploded. Uh, The way retailers used to mark up their goods made it so expensive that they were charging interest rates up to 80%. So when the day that Sheen shows up with something that's 70% cheaper, guess what? It, it grows beyond what anybody can ever dream of because you're solving people's needs. It's a different approach to solving. You have to understand what are the problems so you can solve them. And I think we have a deep understanding of that. And this is why we can partner with these companies and help them grow their businesses. And it's very different. Uh, and that, and I think that that's why founders like us. And you will see that in the investments that we're starting to make are founders who truly appreciate the experience that we can bring to help them. And on the other hand, you have a lot of different kinds of sophistication. I was just in Scarsdale, New York, and I tried to buy a bagel and they said, sorry, cash only. In Brazil, that's a laughable statement. Nobody would say cash only. You pay instant real-time transfer from your bank account to the merchant's bank account using your phone everywhere. And Latin America has something like 25% of the world's fintechs. 25%, a quarter of the world's fintechs are in Latin America. Brazil is probably the most sophisticated financial market I've ever come across. You can securitize any stream of cash flows and sell it to the market tomorrow, and it'll be purchased and distributed and bought by investors. So these levels of sophistication are not really understood outside of LATAM. And so you'll come across a company in Brazil that is very capital intensive, but most of it is debt. And in Brazil, that's not a risk because you can actually raise a lot of debt really easily through a bunch of different avenues. So as long as it's not equity intensive, it's still an interesting capital efficient company, but that's more difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't spent time there. 